new day, new verse. Let's dig into three through five. Here we go. Do you want to be on good terms with the government? Be a responsible citizen and you'll get on just fine, the government working to your advantage. But if you're breaking the rules left and right, watch out. The police aren't there just to be admired in their uniforms. God also has an interest in keeping order and he uses them to do it. That's why you must live responsibly, not just to avoid punishment, but also because it's the right way to live. And, and there is this interesting idea of, you know, that's the right way to live. Okay, but what happens when the government isn't the one living responsibly? What if the officers are the ones that are not upholding the law? And, and it kind of gets this interesting thing. How do you handle the situations that are in some major cities right now? In a lot of major cities, if we're honest, there is a great deal of unrest. So how does one handle it? You know, does one stand up for the injustice, stand against? You know, where where do, where do you do it? And because it's interesting, you know, nationalists have used Romans thirteen a lot to say, well, no, you're supposed to do exactly what the government says. And it's like, uh, you know, I'd rather do what God says. Thanks. So it's kind of gets this idea of what does it look like then when those who belong to the kingdom do it. And I started thinking about the fact that living responsibly. So let's say you're in a government that is obsessed with breaking the law, violating people's natural and God-given rights. What do you do? How do you fight against it? Now Jesus' example is the suffering servant to wash the feet, to die for the enemy. Now, the internal response is to want to fight against it, you know, at, at least for me. And, and I would imagine a lot of people out there, too. It's that, you know, you see an injustice, something has to be set right. There's just something on a fundamentally different level that says this is an injustice or this isn't an injustice. So it strikes me, okay, if we're dealing with these injustices, how do we do it? You know, because if, if we're trying to do just by our own whim and will, generally that we tend to become... A bit violent. Not always, not always. But, you know, there is that still innate fight or flight measure. And I wonder, what if fighting doesn't look like physically beating back? What if it looks different? Because in Revelation, Jesus comes out and the sword is not in his hand, it's in his mouth. And, and I know it recognize, you know, it signifies the authority, but I've always wondered, what if it means something more? What if the sword out of his mouth is because just a simple word is the authority? You know, mirrors the idea in the creation that God just simply spoke. So if the authority is in the mouth of just a simple word, then what if God doesn't need us picking up swords? I mean, clearly we see all throughout the Bible that God will use very few people and sometimes none at all to win a battle. He doesn't really need human beings to do it. Just, you know, one comet storm later, done! So what if the being a responsible citizen, what, what if the right way to live is by embracing Jesus' example of the suffering servant? What if it's when they take your coat to offer them your cloak kind of thing? What if it is to respond to injustice, not with more injustice? Because anger against anger, it just increases more anger. You know, there's pure emotion and volatility. There's no reason. It's, what, if, what if part of the gift that makes human beings the very good creation is that capacity to reason? You know, the capacity to say, I want to be a good citizen of the kingdom to which I belong. Because the government is inconsequential in a sense. Now, Paul says that yes, it has an importance in so much as there is authority, because God, li uh, in order, sorry, order, because God likes the order. But in the grand scheme of eternity, they're not going to last very long anyway. So it's this kind of line, you know, that it's not really supplication, it's not really ignoring, it's embracing the other person and not getting into a discussion about the things that don't matter. 
because to me, if you're a responsible citizen, you know, it's a two-layer thing. You know, it's not just the government to which we belong on a nationality, Colombia, the U.S., blah, 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 Canada, what have you. But it's the fact that we're citizens of God's kingdom, sovereign citizens of God's kingdom, you know, like in the uh, lowercase s idea, that we use our autonomy to worship God, that we embrace him because we need him. And, and it, it's this interesting connection that separate but whole and these beautifully intricate paradoxes. And I know it's a bit off the travels from the verse itself of, you know, the getting along with the government and the government working to your advantage. Sometimes it won't look like that. Sometimes justice will not look the way it is supposed to in the moment. Because God's truth always wins out. God's justice always wins out. So if we're living like we belong to that government and that kingdom, well, then it doesn't really matter what other people do because we're responding to that style of governance, the one that says, love thy neighbor. So that when a government over us, a national government kind of thing over us, or what have you, acts of foul, we still do it the right way. Because the law is usually in our corner. You know, take, for example, free speech. What someone says is inconsequential because they have the right to say what they will if freedom of speech is a thing, you know? Because that's the law I'm working with. Now, it can get a little fun, you know, and this is where the intricacy of how living as a believer, I think, becomes the difficult task. That it is respecting the others around us. Because, you know, God still has them in there for a reason. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, for a reason. And since that reason may not be shown to us because we're not entitled to anything, let alone that kind of information, we show them respect. Not, not because we respect them, necessarily, but because God shows us that to love others is to offer them that kind of love, to offer that kind of compassion. Because if none of us knows what it's like to be in anyone else's shoes, then we can't really start jumping into these groups are evil, or these groups are evil, or these groups are evil, considering the fact that in the hearts of men dwelleth evil. That's why we need God to write the Torah on our hearts, why we need Him in us. Because inherently you don't need to teach a child the concept of mine or selfishness. Because that tendency is there, it echoes out, it creates that web of destruction. So, for this verse, I don't necessarily think of it as worrying about the government government. I see it as focusing on the big G government, the kingdom's governance. Because God will always work things out. No weapon formed against this shall prosper. So, you know, it very well could be that Paul, writing this to the Romans, is not just writing in language that would get authorities who think their way of life is being threatened to simmer the hell down with language and everything else. It's also to saying to fellow believers, guys, you don't have to worry about that Roman centurion because the Roman centurion isn't the police force. He's a person. Who he may work for may make him a bit of an ass. But remember, Mark, one of the disciples, was a tax collector. He worked with the Romans. Of the disciples, you had somebody who was actively working against the Roman occupation and somebody who was working for it. So then the kingdom of style of living, the right way of living, sees the person, not their position. The position then helps one understand the person more. Because if you've got all these responsibilities on your shoulders, whether or not you're doing them, that's a different discussion. But at the very least, it's that empathy. You know, why is this person reacting that way? Well, what if they're dealing with fear constantly? That's going to put them on edge. Because fear tends to make people react stupidly. And so if somebody's already on edge, something else puts them on edge, of course shit's going to go sideways. And again, pardon the French. I just, I wanted to get real with this stuff. Because there's a lot of stuff going on in the world. And all nations all over this world. Dealing with the same kind of injustice. And it's like, 
I don't want hate to move into any of our hearts. Because we should hate the sin, but not the sinner. The person may be a screw-up, but so are we. If we don't offer them mercy, then how can any of us grow? That, that would be my question to you with Romans 13, verses 3 through 5. Because Paul's not an idiot, and I could easily see him writing words to the people of the church saying, hey, don't worry about... Because you know, Rome was actively crushing Christians by the end of Paul's life. How many of the original church leaders were executed by Rome or the, you know? And so it's like, if that's the stuff they're going through, the kind of stuff that we're seeing happen in different places all over the world, well, how did they respond? And they responded not by worrying about somebody in a red cloak and focusing on praising God all the more. You know, in Acts, just as a little close out thought here, in Acts, when Paul and Silas are thrown into a Roman prison after being beat up in, I think it's, um, Syria? Anyway, they're in the prison. It's about midnight. They're praising God. All the shackles fall off. They could have bolted for it. They could have left the Roman centurion there. But instead, reaching out with that little bit of mercy, saying, don't take your life, didn't manage to just bring a single soldier to the kingdom. It brought an entire family. So what could a little bit of mercy do to spread the kingdom in your world? I hope God reveals it to us today. I will see you guys tomorrow for six through seven. God bless and see you then.